Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, on day two of the fifth European Forum for New Ideas. And now we have a session about European single market, how to put it right and make it single indeed. This session will be moderated by Małgorzata Bonikowska from Think Tank. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dorota, and I would like to thank the partners and organizers of this um, session that our uh, center, our think tank, will be discussing these matters with you. Market, what kind of market should it be? How should the European single market strategy should look? I don't think anyone in Europe has any doubt that we can, we can tell each other stories about the European project and its future. Maybe it's an uncertain future, but one thing is for sure that economic collaboration and the cooperation within a single European market is a huge achievement and everybody believes so. This is our great European success and it has not been easy. It took us 40 years to build this market. And of course there is the question, how is it doing and what is going to, to happen? Because Europe is undergoing various processes, the world keeps developing, there are various new phenomena, new technologies, digitization. We have a deregulation wave and so we want to deregulate many things that have so far been regulated in Europe. We have this trend to open towards the world. We negotiate international agreements um, about um, the TTIP, for example in the lead and all this influences the shape of this market and we also experience in spite of certain legal comfort that this market is indeed single but we have certain gaps in this unity so this single market is not single fully and there are a few reasons for this or maybe more than just several uh, reasons for this that this is still the situation in Europe so this is what we are going to discuss and last but not least the most important thing that the single market has businesses operating in it there are companies Polish companies other me EU member state companies operating in Poland so we would also like to understand their outlook on the future of the single market and how it what it's like to be here and uh, do business here and what is what kind of contact the contacts there are between the public sector the private sector and the regulator on the EU level um, so this is the subject matter of our today's meeting and now the Prime Minister Jerzy Buzek has uh, uh, come to our pavilion. He is the chairman of the Program Council of this um, of the Forum of New, New Ideas. So Mr. Prime Minister, you've never let us down. I knew you would come, so thank you for that. Prime Minister Buzek, I think, I hope, will give us a bit more uh, emotion from Brussels and he will tell us what is uh, being talked about uh, uh, the, Europe, the single market. Good afternoon. I apologize for being late, but I'm coming straight from Elblong here. So there was some quick uh, thinking involved along the way, and I did, slipped a little bit during this moving between Elblong and here. When talking about single market, ladies and gentlemen, we have to recall its uh, early history. We weren't uh, in the European Union at the time as in Poland. It was 20 years ago when the creator the mm, creator said that nobody can fall in love with a single market, but then he immediately added that he, you can fall in love with the fruits of this market. And this is something very rightful. It's, it's difficult to fall in love with the idea itself, but the results are excellent. Uh, I have uh, seen people worldwide who want to come to Europe just to ask us uh, how we did it. These are people from Southeastern Asia, South America, students, those who are thinking seriously about their own continent and about the collaboration between countries which in various ways built the um, 
nationality and their states, their countries, and now they want to be closer to each other. So we are a reference point, a benchmark for millions of people worldwide. So this is our soft power. This is what the European Union represents. They would like to repeat this themselves. And we have to admit that it hasn't been easy to come up to create the single market. Uh, the encouragement for the single market and better proximity was to push forward the matter of the euro. As we know, it is a bit controversial because when talking about single market, we must not forget that this is just a fragment of a single market, um, to be honest, because these ideas were quite parallel to each other. And we have to say that the single market has been designed well, although not perfectly implemented, and we still miss a lot of things, and a lot of things need to be implemented. The euro has been designed quite well, but with some deficiencies. Uh, we know that uh, Chancellor Kohl imagined that this would um, go much further, a uh, stability and growth pact. It uh, should have uh, been much stricter in the opinion of the creators of this pact, the pact that describes the euro, but it wasn't. And, uh, and the first countries to break the rule of stability and growth were France and Germany. In in mid-first uh, ten of the 21st century. And uh, other matters look a bit differently because we have not opened in all possible ways. Uh, there are still many bottlenecks. The previous commissioner for um, single market, Michel Barnier, did a lot for these barriers and these problems which the single market uh, was facing uh, to be removed. Uh, he had 12 items on his agenda and most of them were implemented. If we were uh, to talk seriously about the single market, I think we should begin without going into detail which Commissioner Barnier presented, but this is, can certainly be a benchmark and reason for discussion here among us in a while, but there are two key components which we mustn't forget, uh, components to the single market. One of them is a very important one, is the single digital market. If we are talking about the single market as a whole, the single digital market is uh, its absolute foundation and a key module as a driving force. What are we working on the single digital market uh, at, at for at all and uh, the single market as a whole? Well, because due to the digital single market, we want to have uh, invent innovation in our economy, more investments. So investments and innovation is how we want to become competitive. And be, being, by being competitive, we want to grow a lot. And this growth are supposed, is supposed to give us uh, new jobs in order to bridge this huge gap which was f created during the crisis in the European Union. The number of the unemployed is uh, higher than it was uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So the goal is to create new jobs. In order to create new jobs, we need the single digital market and single market um, as a whole. And the growth in the European Union has to be 2, 2.5 or, uh, or three, even 3 percent. And the countries which are less developed today, then they should probably grow 4, 5 or even 6 percent. And let's remember that we did have these growth uh, uh, factors um, before the crisis, not only in the Baltic states or Slovakia, but in other countries as well. In stable Western countries, the growth was 2, maybe 3 percent. So this is what we are fighting for today. The single market is one of the main motives for what we do and um, an objective of what we want to achieve. Significant growth and new jobs. Of course, no one needs to be told then that the single digital market is supposed to enable free flow of goods, services, capital, and people in, uh, in a way. And we need to remember it at all times. 
the Internet of Things, all the cloud computing uh, processes, these are the simplest and best known ways which have to be a component of the single digital market. It will be extremely important for SMEs and startups. Without the uh, single digital market, we can't even dream of making of, uh, of this happening. We have one clear success already because the telecommunications package uh, has been um, adopted. And within a year, uh, roaming fees will disappear completely within a year, and they will dis disappear completely. Uh, now they will be reduced next year, the beginning of next year, but later they will disappear. And this has already been said in terms of the date and how it's going to be done. The neutrality of the web has been guaranteed on the top level from among all the solutions worldwide. The European Union has the most advanced uh, neutrality of the network. Uh, some believe that it's still not sufficient, maybe in some um, items, but the European Parliament managed to convince the member states that the neutrality of the web is absolutely key if you want to create a good market. There's no comparison with what, with what there is in uh, the Asian countries or even the US. Of course, what's uh, very important is consumer rights. We have enforced them in uh, the European Parliament. I was the organizer of these negotiations. The head of uh, the Commission for Research and Energy is responsible for negotiations. So because I have this position, I organized the negotiations with the Council. This is what was my job. So we managed to uh, resolve the spectrum items and um, and unless this is uh, sorted out completely, we cannot move forward in uh, ICT, in the telecommunications. When talking about single market, and when we emphasize the importance of the single digital market, I don't think anyone um, has any doubts that this is the kind of market that uh, the single market cannot do without. And this is a single energy market. This is what we are used to in Poland. We have been um, promoting it for a very long time uh, in the European Union. Previously, we called it European energy community. Now it's a single uh, energy market. And I am convinced that this is a huge opportunity for the single market to exist as such, because now we have such huge differences in energy prices on the European continent, in gas, for example, important from outside, especially from the east. And these differences make it impossible to compete uh, fairly. How can you compete if gas in Poland is much more expensive than gas in Germany? And as we know, it, this gas comes from the same source, from Yamaha or other, other parts of Russia. So this is an injustice and lack of solidarity between us in the European Union, so we have to overcome it if we want to have fair competition in the European Union. It's, it's also about the prices of other kinds of energy, maybe crude oil, maybe uh, electricity. There is one country today which has high uh, rates on electricity, for example, Italy. In many other EU countries, electricity is subsidized, and if it is subsidized, then it's difficult to talk about competition. In many countries, prices are regulated. Also in Poland, there are several countries which don't have uh, prices that are regulated. They are free. So this is a kind of um, transparency, and this follows the rules of good fair competitions, if, uh, especially if uh, there are subsidies for renewable energy. That's another issue. I uh, authored a report which was accepted by 90-something percent of the members of the European Parliament about the single market, so I know how many details there are to be sorted out. So member states are really not uh, not doing what they should. They are not implementing the, the directive that are relevant, and they don't meet the tasks that have been imposed on themselves. 2011, 2013, I 
participated in those councils, 2011, 2010. I was uh, participated in European uh, councils where the heads of European states assumed that by 2015 we will have uh, ready and working a single European market. At that time, uh, competition uh, in services in the single market, in, in terms of services, in terms of goods, then it will have a completely different dimension. So this competition will be a full opening and will provide a huge opportunity for SMEs which are waiting to buy energy, not just from the closest um, power station, closest in terms of distance, or maybe natural gas from the closest uh, port. LNG may be from a further distance. There are such possibilities, for example, in the Nordic countries, in the heart of Europe, Austria, Germany, uh, partially Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Belgium, they already have this kind of market, the British Isles. So there are already such regional markets where you can buy electricity from far away. In the UK, it is already used on a smaller scale on the island, but there is a strict competition between the generators of electricity, so uh, it re requires smart metering, etc. But I am emphasizing these two things and these two markets within the single market, so single digital market and single energy market. And I am not emphasizing it just because I'm responsible for it, because uh, this is uh, in I'm mean, in charge of the committee that handles it, but because there is no single market as such, and it cannot exist if we don't address these two important markets. Our commissioner, Binkowska, is in charge of the single market as a whole, and generally speaking, uh, with the industry, SMEs, uh, the space, outer space, and so I'm also in charge of, of this under my commission, but uh, the single digital, digital market is handled by uh, Vice Pre um, Chairman ANSIP with uh, eight to ten commissioners who all together create the single digital market. It's a huge venture calculated for the next five years. There are four more years for the uh, commission and the European Parliament in its current setup. And in terms of the single energy market, it is uh, established by Shevchov, Mr. Shevchovich, Vice President, who has been with us uh, since this morning. And this is a matter of work for 12 commissioners. So the European Commission, you need to remember, has a quite different hierarchy than it used to have even several years ago. So it's organized in the following way. There are seven groups of commissioners. And these groups of commissioners are um, led by seven vice, vice com seven commissioners, and there are, vi there are, for example, commissioners like uh, Ms. Binkowska, who collaborates with three vice uh, chair persons, vice presidents. So this is how the structure works, and uh, it is working quite okay. I am convinced that uh, in the near future we will have proof that the European Commission and the Parliament and the Council member states are all working towards uh, bridging the gap in these two most crucial markets, digital and energy market, and that they will complete all the tasks which have been taken, were taken in the previous season by Commissioner Barnier and which described 150 narrow, oh, 150 bottlenecks in the single market uh, on for goods, services, capital, maybe also flow of people. So removing the barriers in those 150 bottlenecks is difficult because these are not just decisions down to the European Commission and European Parliament. These things have to be implemented in all member states. And I'm emphasizing it because wherever we are from, there are a lot of people here who are not from Poland, but from other member states. Wherever we are, we should pressurize the governments to bridge those gaps in order to 
blaze the trail in order for our single market to really be able to operate. I'm convinced that we are not going to get out of crisis. We are not going to handle the uh, negotiations with the U.S. Uh, in the TTIP in terms of investment and free trade. We are not going to handle it if we don't structure and construct a good, solid and responsible market for energy and digital market and the single market as a whole. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, please uh, have a uh, rest in the first row here. Thank you also very much for, for this accessibility. Your academic experience uh, is, uh, serves you well, and you've talked very accessibly about things that are difficult. Now, time for our guests. The formula is a little bit different from um, a panel session. We will have eight-minute rounds um, to describe various issues that uh, Prime Minister Buzek described. And our, um, our guest, uh, first guest uh, comes from Germany, so we'll have an expert opinion. So he, he's already joined us. Thank you very much for being so efficient. Uh, Roland Freudenstein, Deputy Director of Research, Wilfried Martens Center for European Studies, Germany. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, you talk, speak uh, beautifully in Polish, but uh, you can choose your language. Maybe you can switch to English. Uh, what I would like to ask you is to give, uh, for you to give us an expert opinion. Professor Buzek gave us a political perspective, also from perspective, uh, perspective of uh, the institutions where he works, European Parliament, for example. But how can you uh, summarize the stage where we are now in terms of single, uh, the single market and those barriers and bottlenecks? Where are they now? Thank you very much. Now. Uh, I love Poland, but I think that well, I, I look at a poll, an honorary poll in my best moments. Thank you very much. One of the beauties of being in this country is that you don't have to explain what a Radio Yerevan joke is, and that it was arguably the most successful series of jokes in the former Soviet empire. So, you know, Yerevan, I give you one example. Question to Radio Yerevan is, uh, is it true that they're giving away Mercedes limousines uh, for free on Red Square in Moscow? And the answer is, in principle, yes, but it's not Moscow, but Leningrad. It's not uh, Red Square, but it's Nevsky Prospekt. It's not Mercedes limousines, it's bicycles, and they're not given away for free, they're stolen. So uh, the question, do we have a single market, could be answered, in principle, da, no. The um, Single Market Observatory, a time-honored institution financed by the European Union, counts more new obstacles to a complete single market than old obstacles that have been removed. Um, if you talk about uh, the single market in services, the mutual recognition, full mutual recognition of professions in all member states uh, is only valid for seven out of 800. Don't, don't ask me to, to enumerate the 800 professions, but anyway, it gives you an idea of the, of the relationships here. And as we've all seen in the last couple of weeks, the free movement of persons in the Schengen zone is under the biggest question mark ever. So there is, there is reason to talk about the obstacles. Now, I want to, you know, instead of just staying with the symptoms, and I've given you some impressions, and Professor Buzek has, has also given you a few examples, I'd rather go further and ask for the political reasons for these obstacles, and then take it another step further and say which psychological mechanisms are standing behind those political factors that are still creating obstacles to the single market. 
with one word, or two words actually, I would say vested interests in the member states. It's not necessarily the governments or all political parties. It is vested interests. It is groups that claim that the single market is a beautiful idea, but not in this particular area. And this can be trade unions. This can be consumer organizations. This can be NGOs in the environmental sector or whatever. It can be entrepreneurs, big and small. And so I think, you know, having, having come to this conclusion that we still have in sizable areas of the single market and notably in services and notably in areas that back in the 90s didn't even exist like the digital uh, sphere, we have in these areas formidable obstacles to a completion of the single market, I think we need to, as I said, take one more step and ask for the psychological factors behind. And there I see three. First of all, at least for the last six years, the EU and political actors in the member states as well have been in crisis response mode. And frankly speaking, it's been getting worse. Crisis response mode means that we look at the, the immediate problems. We're, we're like the fire brigade that's trying to put out the fire and that has less and less time and energy, political energy too, to actually take a step back, look at the whole picture and think strategically. I mean, this is a fact. And there's no easy way out because, as I said, you know, the crisis seemed to be, seemed to be hitting harder um, as we speak, but we need to reserve that space for strategic projects and one of those certainly is the completion of the single market. Second factor, you know, deregulation. By the way, that word has acquired a bad connotation. But you know, we shouldn't even overemphasize semantics here. We can call it um, smart regulation. Now, you know, anyone who does a little bit of uh, uh, no, political science 101, when he hears smart regulation, recognizes deregulation. Uh, cutting red tape. Now, that sounds sampa, that sounds cuddly, that sounds acceptable, because red tape is something that all citizens find repugnant. And yet, and yet, and yet, if you come back to those interest groups I named before, well, one guy's cutting red tape is the other guy's abolition of 150 years of achievements of the workers' movements of Europe. Now, let's be honest. You know, I think we need to at least name the problem here and recognize that in the end, we have to make clear that, so, so to speak, sacrificing one interest or that serving one interest doesn't necessarily mean sacrificing another interest. In other words, and this brings me to the third point, last one. the thinking and last, the thinking of in terms of zero-sum gains. You know, that one person's gain is another person's loss and vice versa. Now that, that would be ultimately the, the strategy to take and I think that's the biggest psychological obstacle and you know, I come from a center-right think tank. I can't help mentioning it here. Zero-sum thinking in economics has been a specialty of the political left and of populists, by the way. And, you know, even some people in our own political family, the EPP. I admit that. But by, by and large, it's a specialty of the left. And I think if we, if we come to that conclusion, I think we have a, a, a nice array of points we need to tackle, including the political, including the psychological points, and I think uh, the Commission is on a good way in doing so, but it needs to become more political. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Roland Hildenstein, I hope he's not encouraging us uh, to that we love our single market. 
we should not uh, laugh at the single market. And the European Commission definitely should respond to that. It should say what it intends to do in the next four years and what it has in its agenda. So now I'm asking our second guest. We have today with us Dr. Tomasz Kusak, the head of Cabinet of Commissioner for Internal Market and Industry, Elżbieta Binkowska. The question is here, on the table. Off you go. Hello, everybody. It's a great honor for me to be um, here with you. On behalf of Commissioner Bienkowska, I'd like to send her hello. The question now is in very good time, because on Tuesday, the European Commission will be discussing the first proposal on communication on the internal market, single markets, and for some weeks now in the future, we'll be defining it so that uh, we'll um, adopt all the package by the end of October. And now something about the discussion and what is the context of it. It's really important. Prime Minister Buzek has presented the context of the new commission, which is working in the project teams uh, led by the uh, chairman. And as a result, all the collegium will, uh, will um, have impact on the final results. And this is something new because usually it was just the, um, it was limited to portfolio of commissioner. But now when we talk about the single market, we are talking about everything which the commission is dealing with. So it's not only the strategy which we are constructing, but the uh, capital union, energy union, um, circular economy, the digital markets, all these strategies have their single market company which of the commissioners is um, liable for it, which is one of the greatest successes of this commission. We operate jointly and we try to respond to what you have said. And this is a political commission and it's looking uh, at the political objective, the single market. Now, something about the context. When the economic crisis hit us, we've had uh, research what's happening on the silk market. And then we saw clearly that import and export internally is, uh, was decreased, but export and import of uh, services increased in spite of all the barriers. So we see determination and very strong will of the member states of the entrepreneurs to operate outside their national states. However, we identified three major issues. The first one is this recognition, no recognition of um, uh, professional titles. And people are now afraid this is very uh, important psychological barrier because people do not know what's going to happen in the next country. And we have very broad spectrum of actions. The second thing, no will to take the risk of investment in a different country. And here again, this is the psychological problem. We don't see any possibility how to make job easier to the entrepreneurs, but also several sociological aspects, uh, environmental aspects are to be met. The third thing is consumers' discrimination, a clear, apparent one. In July, we had this clear example when a company which we know so well, Euro Disneyland, they have very conscious policy of different ticket prices depending on where you come from and depending on your nationality. Obviously, the single market objective is not to have single price everywhere because the economic criteria will uh, decide and have to decide that different markets within the same single market. But here, apparently, we had a situation when someone who entered, who bought tickets um, on the internet when they came from France, they paid different price uh, than his um, than someone from the UK, depending on the IP address. And the same went for uh, someone who um, who wanted to buy the ticket at the um, cashier. And there are many situations like that. So the answer which we want to propose on the 6th of October is to uh, take up 
steps which would uh, uh, reduce or um, which would um, take away all the discrimination so that the consumers will feel safe when they uh, do the shopping. They have uh, access to a broad spectrum of services available on the single market with no barriers. That if someone wants to start a company and they start business here in Poland and then they want to operate on the single market, then they can do it without any other administration barriers in the second country where um, they are they are understood as a business uh, based on uh, the business uh, registration in the home country with all respect to all the EU laws. And three, if today we see that someone tries to produce a good and in order to produce a pen, they need to meet a criteria of 15 directives, then we can say that it will discourage every entrepreneur from doing anything and definitely against innovation. So the objective of the single market will be to limit the wide spectrum of regulations which bring uh, which make uh, it almost impossible for the goods you produce to be sold. Yeah, one thing is strategy, and the European Commission has a leading role. But then we have the member states. Uh, Prime Minister Buzek, he's mentioned here that there we ha are having issue. How do you tackle that, or how do you plan to tackle that? It's in our strategy. Uh, the basic issue today is the fact that the member states they do not implement the EU law, uh, especially in the so-called service directive. Many member states uh, uh, are sinners. It's difficult to list all of them, but all the sins. But we want to um, introduce two basic um, starting points. The first one is, will be the new attitude. We are talking with a member state. Why they don't implement the directive? If this member state cooperates with us, then we try to find solution, solution which will give us a quicker path of implementation. Once the member state does not want to take up the dialogue, then the Commission will want to take the rapid path for implementation of this directive. And then the second thing is that we need to know the market better. Until now, the commissioner did not have any option to intervene on the market and to uh, address companies and ask why they made um, certain decisions. One of the objectives of our strategy is to make it possible, is to make possible to the commissioner to ask questions directly to companies, but not to punish the companies, uh, not, to, um, not to do that, but to be stronger in the discussions with the, mem with the governments, why, this mem why the director are not implemented. Well, I believe that AFNI is very well in line with this trend because here the representatives of the European Commission may listen to the companies and we will give floor to them really soon. But before that, I would like um, to I would like you to comment the digital market. The digital market, as Prime Minister Buzek said, is a very important, if not the most important element of the single market because it develops the market. It shows where in what areas will be operating in the future and that our industry will be based on in the Internet, definitely. And I believe that the added value of the European economy will be there by digitalization of the economy. We'll be looking at new business models. Uh, we've heard a lot recently about the business model. Uh, there's this company who is uh, providing uh, transport services. Uh, but the new uh, business model should be treating, uh, treated as an opportunity for new services, and the consumer uh, would benefit strongly from uh, it. New jobs may be created by them. Digitalization of economy, this is the future. These are additional jobs and economic growth. Thank you very much. And now I want to give floor to companies or to a company. Because now we have this question where someone, the Prime Minister of India said about bureaucracy, that maybe it would be imported instead of constructing a red tape world, maybe we would give them a red carpet. So CEO, for you, the red carpet for a company. 
I hope we'll be having that in Europe. Will you want the European Commission or Europe to open or to give the red carpets to Europe? Wojtek Spiel, the CEO of Totalizator Sportowy from Poland. I know that we are a strategic partner, but uh, the applause should be to everybody. But I'm happy that we are uh, such a nice bunch of people here. We can talk about the single market, which evokes a lot of emotions. But not only with the companies, but also with the customers. I represent a very specific industry. It's gambling, of course it is, but uh, it's more than that. We have lotteries, we have casinos and so on. But having in mind in what direction the digital single market goes, we as an environment, we are very much afraid that it, we will uh, get rid of everything, both positive and negative things. So with development of new online, new technologies, online gambling has become very popular, not only in Europe, but across the world. The service now are located in Gibraltar and Malta, and they offer products in a variety of languages across Europe and uh, from Poland. Well, there were 5 billion zloty which disappeared from Poland with no tax whatsoever next year. In the second half year, we have Malta presidency. Malta, as far as I know, has 20% of GDP from online gambling. And I'm convinced that under the new uh, single market uh, regulation, the online gambling will be as the sale of furniture, as we heard during this year Lottery Congress. And now we're thinking, where, why did we have this idea of the national interest of uh, lotteries? And I'm talking about national lotteries, which operate nationally. They generate profit. This profit mainly uh, is spent for sport, uh, culture, health, public uh, projects, charity organizations, and what kind of money we are talking about? Well, it's 75, including Poland, it's 76 billion euro annually, including 25 billion will be spent on public uh, projects and online gambling will eat up this so less will go to people because this money this profits they go back to the society and we as sector organization we are thinking what to do about it which is why we've made up this decision to establish a new organization which will not be only sectoral organization which will not speak on behalf of the business, but with the beneficiaries who receive the money in a different way. And together, arm in arm, we want to talk about it with the European Commission, with the European Parliament, and show where these problems are. Maybe people who deal with it, they do not necessarily understand because such, well, normally in life, many difficult things are in details. I understand it would be an ideal situation to let everything off go to the single market. We've, we've seen what happened in Denmark, which opened the market. Everybody was so happy in the beginning. And they say, oh, great uh, revenues. But after a year, they've seen that that uh, people who are the, the gamblers and the is uh, uh, the costs of them, uh, all the addicts, uh, people who are addicted to gambling, uh, the, the, the treatment of them uh, will cost much more. So my question is whether we have standards for this online gambling. We don't have any. And my request, and my question actually to you, is in what way could we well it's not only about this one thing about gambling but in broader sense 
Because if we look at 45,000 people who work in the administration of the European Union, and in Poland we have information and these people they uh, keep on debating how about the size of cucumber or the color of the tomato. So sometimes we have this feeling that it's not necessarily the way it should be. I'm kind of exaggerating, obviously, now, but somewhere there we have this basic issue. Right, so uh, this question will be addressed later, but now I would like to take this opportunity that you said that you are very open to the dialogue with business to understand the markets a bit better. And here we have the CEO who says that business is not really happy with the present forms of the dialogue. Do you have any, uh, any idea how we could have the effective dialogue? There are plenty of organizations who cannot get through to the parliament, to the commission. Whenever we talk about the dialogue, so this dialogue should be at the very start point for drafting the, uh, the first ideas of concepts of new laws. And then maybe you should come up with the final document. So later when we have amendments, so sometimes it is more difficult to make amendments and we end up with something which looks really nice as a regulation of the market, but after time, with time, because we are looking for new solutions, uh, then we go into deregulation. So it's like a, kind of a game to me. So the better the regulation, the less uh, deregulation we would be. So we really need to be good from the very beginning. So what you request is not to do it in the end of the process, but from the very beginning and jointly to create regulations on the market and also mutual uh, discussion will be really of key importance. Absolutely. Thank you. And our final guest today, and the broader perspective, I hope, because the question here is who operates on the single market and uh, different types of companies, including our social businesses. Now we have the ambassador of France, Pierre Dulle. The ambassador speaks perfect Polish, so I do not know what uh, what language. We don't have any French, so you can choose between Polish and French. Just to be equal here, if you allow me, I will happily speak English. I know it a bit better. So your short comment to this different type of um, business and on something which we may call combination of social factor, social market economy, and what we call a pure business. And business is really about being busy. So can we be busy in business and be social? Do you think it can be combined or do you believe that Europe should go in this direction? Please remember that 10 percent of companies in Europe. Yes, thank you. And I'll try to demonstrate how deeply those conceptions are linked. Sorry? Closer. Uh, when, when we speak of, of, of a about of a socially oriented market economy, uh, to me it sounds like a hint at the uh, uh, soziale Marktwirtschaft, which uh, so-called model of Renan capitalism, which has carried the development of the German economy for decades. And if we look at Europe today, it's true that uh, we have to do uh, with uh, a, a broad array of uh, different varieties of capitalism and academics, some of them are in this room, distinguish between liberal, on the one hand, liberal market capital, uh, liberal market economy, and the coordinated market economy. Uh, the first one being uh, showing, featuring uh, high flexibility, ability of radical uh, innovation and adaptation, uh, but at the cost of high 
uh, inequalities, higher inequalities. On the other hand, coordinated market economies put the emphasis on collaborative production, relations between uh, companies and government, social dialogue, uh, and a lower level of inequality and also a more incremental approach to innovation. So uh, in Europe, many economists fall actually in between two, uh, those two models. A few of them tilt, and I mean, might of course the United Kingdom, tilt rather, at least for the time being, towards the first model, uh, the liberal one. Uh, I, I would just like to, to, to frame uh, the debate, and, and uh, to frame the debate, I would pick in a, from a, a recent uh, article, our Minister for the Economy, Emmanuel Macron, uh, has signed in uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung, and he, he was trying to, to define a way to re-found, to rebuild Europe by, and here I quote him, coupling individual freedom with social justice. So everybody has a, uh, an elaborated, uh, articulated idea about uh, individual freedom, but what uh, uh, I, I would like to delve rather into the second one, social justice, what can that uh, mean? Uh, if we look at uh, single market or the broader concept of marketization or globalization, uh, it does inevitably generate winners and losers. This is sort of a political economy uh, concept. And uh, discrepancies between winners and losers, uh, if they are ignored or not addressed uh, adequately, are liable to fuel hostility vis-à-vis uh, -vis the single market, vis-à-vis -vis Europe, uh, which is associated with it. And uh, this is what we witness today in many European uh, countries, fueling actually Euroscepticism. We saw that in, in, in Greece with Syriza, we have seen it in Italy, uh, uh, five stars movement in, with Podemos and in many other countries we see the, the rise of those uh, Eurosceptic uh, Euro movements uh, or political parties uh, s denouncing the illegitimacy and the illegitimacy of, of Europe and the single market. So uh, what I would uh, like to say this is, we, is that, and to emphasize, is that we need a well functioning social model uh, providing uh, education, providing health, uh, and those are uh, features that allow for a healthy and well educated, efficient workforce, which is, uh, I think, a precondition for markets to function uh, well, and, and this is certainly an approach which would be mo even more warranted in times of crisis, uh, when uh, the, uh, the peaks and, and through hours of the economic cycle are liable to exacerbate this gap I mentioned between uh, winners and losers, and here we, we can expect from that a uh, uh, cushioning effect. Uh, Actually, this, it's not something new. We already have such uh, approaches, uh, not only within, within our own countries, but also uh, between the uh, members of the uh, European Union. Structural funds are actually, the, those are transfers meant to smooth, uh, uh, to erase the territorial disparities and uh, uh, foster convergence between countries and, uh, and regions. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, fiscal and uh, social harmonization would also be, is also in order, and this was, this appeared in a, um, in a, com in a joint article by Emmanuel Macron and Sigmar Gabriel, so uh, uh, a French politician and a, a German politician. Um, another important uh, uh, point actually is the uh, re reviving to, to, to make uh, the market function better, the single market function better, is to revive social di dialogue in Europe uh, and to, to account for a badly needed uh, negotiation between 
capital and labor in order to uh, undertake uh, uh, these, the wide-ranging labor market reforms that are uh, so badly needed. I would like to conclude now uh, by saying that we succeeded, succeeded in setting up a single market, a common currency, a normative Europe, uh, a, a Europe with a growing level of macroeconomic integration, a Europe where industrial policy is not a, a dirty word anymore, uh, a Europe with a defense and armament policy, but we are far cry away from a social Europe that uh, remains uh, really uh, embryonic. Uh, some inroads have been made, uh, for example, with the action plan to solve youth joblessness, but there's uh, some, uh, a lot, more uh, mileage to, to cover um, and uh, certainly ignoring uh, that issue would uh, just further fuel estrangement and diffidence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Europe and single market within our societies. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. A dialogue definitely it is necessary. We in Poland, we are much aware of it. Now we received new instruments. We have a new law on the social dialogue. But still in Poland, in Poland, it's not completed challenge. We still have huge disparities between what we call a social sphere and what is business. The concept of social business in Poland and in Europe is uh, uh, pursued, but really slowly, which may be an, uh, a, a creative driver for the single European market. Well, we've had four short rounds of our guests, and now it's time for you. So I want to encourage you to uh, join to the discussion. I don't know whether you'll be sorry or happy, but um, your time of rest is over. Please come up to the armchair, join us. And before we get to the discussion, one question, an open question or closed question, open to you, all of you. Those who have apps, please grab your cell phones, get the app and find our session. And my question is following. A simple one, but difficult, depending on what you believe. Maybe banal. Can we, is it possible to say that the European single market will be really single? I mean, really single. Tell us. Do we have optimists or pessimists with us on board? Yeah, here we have it. We have only optimists here. I've never expected this kind of result. Maybe, well, could we have this type of answers in election? Don't close your apps because I have another question to you. And now we have a change. So what happened? What happened in the meantime? More people voted, right? So it seems that we are 50-50, so we don't know where, in which direction this will happen. Yes, uh, so thank you very much uh, for voting, but all of you are encouraged to vote uh, for a question at the end of our debate. Dorota is uh, going to help me with uh, ask, accepting the questions from the audience, but before that, before you ask your questions, I have a question to all of you, because this is what we haven't discussed, and we mustn't avoid, we mustn't omit it. What will it be like? with the European single market if we manage to conclude the DTIP and trade and investment uh, partnership. So uh, the, uh, which of you, gent who of you gentlemen would like to respond? Roland Freudenstein, over to you. Uh, thanks. Well, I would phrase it like this. In order to have a fruitful transatlantic trade an investment partnership, we need a true single market. And frankly speaking, if I may add this point, you know, the disaster of Volkswagen's cheating 
I mean, the first thing that came to my mind when I read about this was if we had TTIP in place, that would not have happened. I mean, Volkswagen would not have felt the need to cheat uh, regulations that are different uh, between Europe and the United States. Um, and by the way, what a disappointment for the anti-TTIP activists to see that America can be tougher on car emissions than European regulations. Anyway, so, but I, I just wanted, I'm, I'm just now stealing 30 seconds and I want to come back to the social market economy because this is really important in the context of the single market. You know, the social market economy, as it was developed in a time of crisis, totalitarianism and war, in other words, in the 1930s and 40s. Social market economy is a deeply political concept and it says two things. Uh, first of all, the market is the best guarantee for human freedom. And second, that it takes a strong enough state to defend the market with a big capital M against powerful enemies. And those, those can be unions, they can be cartels of firms, whatever. But the state has to defend the market. And that's the social market economy. And then all the coordination and the government intervention and the redistribution and the funds, that comes later. The core concept is to preserve the market. And that's why the single market is so important. Bardzo dziękuję. Jeszcze jakieś komentarze z pan, z pan doktor Husak. Krótko. Thank you very much. Now, responding to the latest issue of uh, social economy, it seems to us at the Commission that uh, the, the response to the um, economic problems in the EU is the internal market. I remember a sentence from Mario Monti. He said it some time ago, but I think that even today it is valid. Um, the, it is most needed than ever. It is the internal market is less popular than ever, but it's most ne more needed than ever. And this is a clue of the key of the problem. If we want to respond to unemployment, releasing, removing those barriers in the internal market will be the key to create the right uh, investment environment and for growth and new jobs in Europe. But combining it with the discussion on TTIP, I agree fully that if the TTIP was already in place, whatever happened happened with the automotive industry in Europe would probably not have happened. But we need to look at it from the geopolitical perspective. An agreement between the EU and the US would mean a certain, certain standards and a certain counterbalance for the entire world. And no one would be able to uh, counteract it. So the European-American standard would be the dominating one. And there would be a question of what the future would be there for the World Trade Organization because this agreement would probably cause the WTO to lose its uh, rationale for its existence. Javier Solana uh, uh, draw, draw attention to this fact that this partnership is not about uh, the Western world coming together against someone because the world surrounding EU and the US can be sensitive about it, but this is working towards better global trade and economy, including the, uh, fighting the disparities, inequalities. So this is very important as well. Anybody else, um, Mr. Ambassador? Yes, I uh, certainly, uh, this negotiation of the TTIP is uh, warranted and it, it will fill a gap uh, which has been existing for decades. On the other hand, uh, one shouldn't uh, consider it as a magic bullet uh, for um, uh, the United States has a, 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 a relatively small share of its GDP and it represents only 5 to 7 percent uh, of EU countries trade in goods and services. So uh, don't expect an upheaval from that. But uh, there's one point I would like to emphasize here, <coughs> which our negotiating team should uh, certainly has, has in mind, but which where the gap is yawning between Europe and United States. United States, which uh, portrays, it likes to portray itself as uh, a paragon of uh, market economy, but this uh, 
an act called the Buy, Buy in America uh, uh, Act, which uh, well, skews uh, competition in public procurement towards uh, uh, American uh, providers. And uh, the index uh, of openness uh, of, the United, of, of public procurement in the United States and in the U European Union, openness to non uh, EU or to non-American uh, part uh, companies is one to ten. Uh, Europe uh, non-European uh, com uh, companies provide 300 billion uh, covers 300 billion uh, do dollars, I think, uh, yearly, while access to non. Uh, European, to non-American companies for public procurement in the United States is about 30 million. So here is a really a, a huge unbalance which uh, it would be warranted uh, to correct. Dziękuję bardzo. Mamy pytania. Bardzo proszę. Mamy pytania z sali. Bardzo proszę. We have questions from the room. Please go to the microphone. Ja byłam również sprawozdawcą nowego pakietu telekomunikacyjnego. Anna Katarzyna Nietyksza, president of Eurocloud Poland and member of Eurocloud Europe. I was also a reporter on the new uh, telecommunication package on behalf of the European um, committees. That's why I'm close to this subject. So my question is, what in your opinion is more important? for the development of the telecommunications market, for the development of the single digital market as such. Is it education? Because we are sh uh, about a million uh, IT experts short in the European Union, and there are no people who could be quickly uh, producing new know-how. Or do we need m funds? Uh, to a greater extent, and how do we find it? And quickly, um, referring to the panels which we've already had today about big, da big data, there will be another panel about it today. We know that the market of cyber attacks in the EU is worth 290 million euros. We know that the market for cloud computing is also growing in Poland, in Europe, it's worth 42 billion. And we know these figures are very important, but I don't think they are actually, um, they have reached, uh, reached the awareness of teachers in schools. And they don't really speak in sufficiently to the government either. What is more important, funding startups or education? Shall we respond right now? Who would like to respond? Is it education? Well, I'm not connected with telecommunications, uh, but another business, but I think that investing in startups and all things uh, related to innovation is something that gives us uh, great benefits in the future. If we build um, intellectual know-how, uh, definitely it will translate uh, across time and into more than we would get by doing other things, things that would might seem economically justified. But allow me also to refer to TTIP. Poland is a bit on the sidelines of this process. Of course, we are there, we are present, but we don't have global companies. So, in reality, we are a state which uh, has many subcontractors for global companies. And under TTIP, it would be it would be a good thing to negotiate um, in a way in, in a way which would allow our uh, subcontracting companies um, to become globals. Inglot, for example, uh, we it used to be local, just Polish, but now it's present worldwide. Uh, Henryka Bochniarz mentioned Wilton, uh, which also finds its place in Europe. There are more and more such companies which, uh, from being local startups just in Poland, they become global. 
um, Ms. Solange Olszewska is an example of this, that may be of some takeovers of companies, so it's really worthwhile doing it. We haven't discussed many issues because the single market is a very um, capacious topic, but there are also processes connected with the single capital market in the EU. And this is an important element of uh, how to get funds by SMEs. Mr. Professor, and we have other questions from the room. If I may, the question which was asked uh, before, I think education is at the beginning of this road if we really want to achieve great things. Even 15 years ago, it seemed that we were far from the European Union. We were far were away from the Union. The German market uh, voiced that they said that they needed 40,000 IT specialists, uh, that they needed from right now. And maybe today this pressure is not uh, smaller, but we have a completely free full uh, flow of people, so we don't feel it. IBM has recently come to Katowice, southern Poland, and so there is, um, the, there is this drainage of uh, IT specialists from small and medium-sized companies, Silesian Voivodeship, this region is uh, uh, 5 million people, but IBM, one company which came to the Polish market, drained to a large extent SMEs they, they, by taking away the good IT experts. There is such an enormous need wherever we go. We may say that these fashions for various um, directions of study, 35 years ago, for example, marketing and management, environmental protection, these fashions, these, these uh, slogans um, don't mean much in um, universities. You need to do something specific now. Electronics and IT is in fashion now, and you know what uh, that is worthwhile studying, and uh, it's been so for 40 years, so it's been a hit for, since the late 1980s, because those who want to invest, they need people to work with. So I have no doubt at all that education comes first. Although everything, we need everything, we need funds as well, but I think education, education and education is first. I don't think we could expect anything else from you, Mr. Professor. Another question. And my, I, uh, I would like to speak about uh, specifics. Western Europe has a lot more capital uh, than Poland, but we have uh, the labor, we have the um, people in there are 10 times higher assets per one inhabitant in France than in Poland the 20,000 euros uh, to 2,000 euros in Poland in, in Germany it's 135,000 euros per employee in Poland it's 47 uh, it would seem that the capital would flow east and jobs would go west, or people would go west. So my question goes to our guest from Germany. Will the transport market be um, released or unblocked? When we ship uh, goods to France, Spain, or the Netherlands, we have to plow through a lot of formalities, a lot of red tape, uh, in order to prove that our uh, employees get minimal pay. It's calculated differently in Poland and in Germany. In Poland, we get extra pay for for accommodation, for um, uh, travel expenses. When our driver drives goods from uh, Poland to Berlin, the, the center of his life is in Poland. Why? Well, because it's connected with another question to Mr. Ambassador. Because France is the second in line uh, preparing regulations. If the situation in Germany is not changed, 
when if, we are, if you continue to be pushed from this market, the French are ready with our regulations. And one more comment to conclude, maybe because we've uh, captured about uh, one-fifth of the European transport shipping market, but do you really need to introduce such instruments? Thank you. Obviously, if Western Europe has capital and in production it is still leading, then obviously Central Europe is a leader in services. It's really simple. And in this situation, the service directive from 2006 was incomplete, incomplete, and uh, there have been too many possible and um, possible exceptions. You gave perfect examples of that. So, to me, the present form of implementation of the single market is discrimination of the countries which may compete in services. Um, uh, but in, in a on a very, uh, very generally speaking, I think um, the, the 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 completion the completion of the single market is uh, it, it's not only necessary to to stop the discrimination that I described that you described. In fact. But it's also, as Professor Buzek said in the very beginning, it's, it's, a, it's a basic condition to actually get out of the crisis. But anyway, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just repeating what we've all been saying uh, all along on the panel. I'd like to be more precise about one thing. Because you haven't uh, described the situation, uh, something about transport, road transport. In France, the lawmaker states that if the transporting company from Lubuskie, if they transport something to Besançon or uh, Nantes, they uh, unload it. And they operate under Polish law. They may easily do what they want to do. And they can come back to Poland operating under the Polish law. But if this transporter unloads goods in Besançon and loads and carries things to Nantes, then they operate under the delegated posted work directive, which is a different uh, legal regime, more beneficial for Polish companies. But they cannot operate under Polish law. They cannot carry uh, goods from within France from one place in France to the, the other place in Gdańsk, they, then they do not operate under the Polish law, because then they operate, they should operate under the uh, posted work. So from being very general, now we are very detailed, and now we see how much the market is not single. And then we will be having time for the last question. We have at least three people, so please be really brief, a very brief comment. The European Commission will need to take position in this matter because we analyze the situation very thoroughly, the situation in Germany. And 
As my colleague from Brussels said, it is an issue of wrong interpretation or a legal gap which the European Commission has to address, but in a way which, on the one hand, will uh, prohibit us from being discriminated, and on the other hand, it is necessary to uh, try to understand why it happened in Germany. And the European Commission now is in the dialogue with the parties but we see very clearly that there is need to be more precise to clarify the situation. Now let's take all these three questions and then we will have an answers. I represent the multinationals in trade. We are very much for a single market because in Poland we have invested 50 million, billion euro. While for some years now we appeal very heavily to the European Parliament, to the Commission, because the basic European single market rules are violated by the member states. And Professor Buzek highlighted that the member states should remove barriers, but what we see is not only the political will to remove the barriers, but what we see is that new acts of law are now drafted and here Hungary is a leader in it, they have drafted eight legal acts discriminating and promoting protectionism and populism, and we uh, have a P, we have uh, come to we have turned to the European Commission. We'll see how it develops. And uh, my question is whether the European Commission will be able to uh, develop prevention tools so that no new acts are uh, developed, not when they've been uh, decided, but when the legislation process um, is in its very beginning. Hello. My question is about what we hear, whether the present uh, single market uh, uh, role is not beneficial to the strongest one, to, the, to Germany, OECD. Uh, OECD uh, researched how many physicians in each country come from other country. And in Turkey, it's 0.2 percent of doctors who do not come from uh, Turkey. In Poland, it's 2 percent. And in New Zealand, 40 per 42 percent. And Israel, 58 percent. So don't you believe that the richest region in the European Union, they drain the and they take benefits, they live on benefits uh, from the uh, poor countries. Okay, so Dr. Husak first, the first question. In the, the strategy of the single market, we'll have whole chapter on retail trade and recommendations from the European Commission to the member states to improve application of law. And the issue of retail trade is really important to us. In July, the Commission has undertaken many, uh, many steps against uh, member states which did not, uh, which did not follow. Um, the, uh, or stick to the European law. So to us, it is a key chapter. We should definitely, the European Commission should definitely work there. Who can answer the second, the last question? Professor? About brain drain. Well, I want to comment two or three things which we heard at the end. Last night, during the panel session by dinner, we were talking that the uh, free market system has to be repaired. It's not that we'll replace it with something else, because we see no other option. But we want to change it slightly not exchange, but change. 
and the very beginning of our problem was 2008. We are aware of it because then we realized that something was wrong in the system and it was uh, a global issue. If someone says that yet another member state sought to have uh, kind of closing, sealing, uh, they make an attempt to seal the markets, like something of Polish drivers who would go through um, Germany, France is getting ready to take same actions. Everything is because of the crisis. Please remember that. We have this trend that whenever it's bad, then we are sealing up. We, bar we uh, construct barricades instead of saying that together will uh, be better off. And the member states have these obvious tendency that, and all of them, if something's wrong, it's the European Union to be blamed. If something is really bad, so it, it must have been the European Union which did something wrong. But very often and most often the case is that on the level of the European Union, we make attempts to unblock bad things. And we keep talking that on the single market, something is um, taking more benefits than others. Poland joined the European Union 11 years ago, and our SMEs, they, um, it was a success story for them, also for the farmers. All the farmers in Poland who sell agricultural products, these are now SMEs, sometimes major companies. Uh, we have farmers in western part of Poland which are really huge. So we have to be frank. We benefited the single market a lot. There have been many aspects of this, well, cheap labor and so on. But uh, explaining that only some benefit from the single market and others don't, well, we get these suspicions all the time. We have structural funds and we are told, maybe rightly, or maybe we repeat it in Poland, that many of the uh, bit of proposals uh, and many uh, calls, they are won by Western companies and the funds, the funds which Poland received are getting back to Western companies. But it's only natural at an open market, so we should not feel bad about it. You must not put this thesis that someone is drawing more benefits, especially if we take a look at our country and Romanians, they use it very little, but they were not capable to use these structural funds. They never had any reform on regional management and local management. They have no clearly defined local governments, as in Poland. Please remember that this huge success of absorption of the funds, irrespective of what had been built. This is yet another question for next year's. But it was due to local governments. And just last comment, we are complaining on the single market. And sometimes we are right. We have right to say that it's not perfect. But Americans, they they, they've been making their single market for 200 years. They managed to overcome a lot, but not all of it. They are still wondering in these negotiations between the states and this uh, TITP negotiations, the Americans, they have huge problem. We have gone through it because we know that we need to adapt to someone. The countries, they, they get, they adopt themselves, but to Americans is a dramatic challenge, like public tenders. They never allow anybody to their market, and we say, what do you say? You have to let us in. The trade of energy, I want them to open the borders so that we can export uh, gas from the U.S. to Europe and so on. If we are sometimes afraid of TITP, then they have even more fear 
There was this delegation who came in May to the uh, European Parliament, 10 senators, and they said, we are much afraid in some states, in some states it's boiling, that this agreement should not be signed. So please, we need to repair the single market, but we should be proud of it, because we have overcome so many barriers. So in the Southeast Asia, in America, it's something uh, unimaginable success. Thank you. Our time is up. Uh, I don't. So now, Professor said a lot about our joint work. I don't know whether we should be waiting for 250 years to be to have the single market that will, will take shorter. But because this is not good, so it's the regulator and companies and public uh, sector. Um, well, please use your application. Do you believe that in that companies, private sector, should get involved in public matters in the single market? Should private enterprises get involved in public affairs? We choose yes or no, or no opinion. Well, vast majority, 82% for and nine against. EFNI is really important because this is where we want to put the public and the private sector together. Drota, thank you very much for your support and see you again. Thank you. Applause to panelists and the moderators. Stay with us, please. Just a short moment. Sit down. Please sit down. Thank you. Because traditionally I need to give some communiques. So, uh, thank you uh, very much for a very, another very interesting plenary session during the fifth European Forum for New Ideas. Today there is a second round of parallel uh, panels at 5.30 at the Sheraton Hotel. As you certainly know, in the conference room there and at 8 p.m. there is a networking night. Now when you are leaving uh, the pavilion of new ideas, uh, please vote uh, in an opinion poll on the quality of the European Forum for New Ideas. Uh, you need to evaluate this event that we have just concluded, the plenary session on the sin European single market and its strategy. Thank you very much to the panelists, the moderator, Thank you ever so much, and now it's time for a family photo. And uh, you please give a round of applause to the participants in the debate. Thank you.